Snap Judgment Studios. Snappers, do you know at one point, I got a call from the powers that be saying Snap was canceled. That was a very, very, no good, very bad day. But then I realized that the powers that be didn't own this show. You own this show, Snappers. That's why I'm asking you to support it right now at a level that makes sense for you at snapjudgment.org. If you've ever been unable to get out of the car, the kitchen, the office, until you heard the end of the story, please become one of us and support the show that makes it happen at snapjudgment.org because it doesn't happen any other way. You can get Snap stuff, including music, a chance to pitch your story or a backstage pass to spook live. If Snap storytelling is in you, if you depend on this show, please stop for just a moment. Stop the show for just a minute and join at a level that makes sense for you. Snapjudgment.org. I promise you the best sleep ever and a grin on your face when you leap out of bed in the morning. What a deal. Snapjudgment.org. Thanks. Step Judgment is brought to you by Progressive, where customers who save by switching their home and car save nearly $800 on average. Quote at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Okay. So, this is a story about a trick. A trick played on me with great fanfare and elaborate execution. Fifth grade. Fancher Elementary, Mount Pleasant, Michigan, first day of school. Big assembly in the multi-purpose room. And the principal himself steps forward and says he's looking for a new crop of young heroes. Tells us that school crossing guards ensure the safety of our community and are afforded great respect and admiration. Who's up for the challenge? I am. And all of us with our hands in the air were taken up front and solemnly presented an orange vest. They whisk us to another room and tell us all about crossing the streets. They give us a pen we can stick on our vest that reads crossing guard and a whistle. And finally, they hand out posting assignments. Mine was far away at the outskirts of the Fancher Elementary School territory, but I don't mind. Put on a vest that demands respect, authority, and I wait to help someone across the street. And that's when the pack of seventh graders show up. I hold out my hand in an exercise of raw power, and they smack me around the nose and ears and promise a jalapeno wedgie if I ever try that again. Lesson learned. So I wait and I wait and I wait, and there's just one kid, one kid who needs a crossing guard, Gerald snot no second grader so I walk little Jerry across the street and that's it for Jerry I gotta stand there for 35 minutes them's the rules alright I've got no problem with that but see in Michigan there are two seasons winter and almost winter and September doesn't count by October the chill comes quick by November the entire state is unlivable but I have to stand there like an idiot waiting for little Jerry who most of the time never shows up because his mother drives him to school in a heated car comfort so he doesn't get his little easy weirsy coldy woldy I hate Jerry I hate his mother and I hate the principal for sending me out there and one night one of the coldest nights ever in recorded history I know that school's going to be cancelled the next morning and it's going to be awesome. It would be cruel and inhumane to send kids out into an ice storm. I go to bed with a smile on my face, planning out all the fun I'm going to have when I finally get out of bed. Next morning, turn on the TV and watch in horror as they list every single school district in the area except for mine. It's a cold one out there today, folks. Stay indoors if you can. I'm supposed to go out 
and wait in the blizzard for little Jerry, who 99% chance is in the car with his mother drinking hot chocolate? No. No. I can't do it. I just can't. So I hide out for a little while. Just hide out. Warm. And sneak into school with my orange vest on. Like, what's up, what's up? And yeah. After the first bell, snot-nosed little Jerry wanders and cry. Nobody was there to help me across the street. <laughs> the principal's all like, "They're election of duty and someone could have been seriously injured and you have to apologize. And Miss Jerry's mother makes sure to drive her pride and joy every day after that. Saves a dirty look from me. But next year, when a new principal gives the same speech about how he's looking, for a new crop of young heroes, I can't believe I raised my hand. I don't know. I figure maybe finally I get the respect I deserve. Today on Snap Judgment, dirty work. Dirty work. Amazing stories from real people doing the job nobody wants to do. My name is Glenn Washington. Please bring some hot chocolate for your crossing guard because you're listening. (laughs) Snap judgment. Snap is for our first piece. I want to let you know that if you're not comfortable with things like autopsies and coroner's reports this story contains some graphic imagery that said i strongly encourage you to keep listening because our guest name has to be the coolest name of anyone we've ever had on the show snap producer joe rosenberg takes it from here The town of Ringgold, Georgia, is your classic southern small town. Nestled in the northwest corner of the state, along the border with Tennessee, it's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone's story. Which means that everyone knows the story of what happened to McCracken Poston. Today, McCracken is a lawyer with a small practice in town. But 20 years ago, he was the district's state representative. And in 1996, I lost by landslide. I raced for the United States Congress. I was the first Democrat since the Civil War to lose this district. And I lost every county. So I said my goodbyes, gave my concession speech for the media. I basically saw everybody out, thanked them all, locked up the campaign office on the end of the block of this old historic block in Ringgold. And I was walking back to my vehicle when I heard this voice uh, that was coming from a long shuttered Zenith television repair shop. And it said, you got beat, didn't you? And the, the voice from the shadows belonged to Alvin Ridley. Alvin Ridley had been a uh, TV repairman in town for all of my childhood. But the place had been shuttered inexplicably in the early 1980s, and everybody said he just kind of lost his mind. He uh, probably was there that night posting some of the missives on the inside of the glass that he always did, accusing the local government of running all his customers off. He had allegedly threatened people's lives when uh, they had uh, crossed him, and he had become more and more reclusive. His house was frightening looking. It was boarded up. The once open porch had been closed in with keep out and no trespassing. And the feeling of neighbors and children was that he was the boogeyman. It didn't scare me, but, you know, I continued walking. I didn't think of him anymore. And then, uh, 
October 4th, 1997 happened. I went into town and people were excitedly talking about that there was a dead woman found at crazy Alvin Ridley's place. People just didn't know if this was a rotting corpse or skeletal remains or the last thing on anybody's mind was a freshly dead woman, which is what it was. So when that word came out, everybody was saying, well, who is that? Uh, Who's missing? And then the wave of information came out that he says it's his wife. Did, Did you know he had a wife? No. It was a shock. I had no knowledge that he had a wife. Nobody that regularly interacted with him knew that he had a wife. The deceased's name was Virginia Ridley, and records confirmed that she had in fact been married to Alvin for many years. But beyond that, no one knew anything about her. Where had she been all this time? What had she been doing? More to the point, perhaps, what had Alvin been doing? Probably the, the, the thing that kind of made everybody suspicious from the beginning was that Alvin did not behave like you would expect someone to behave if you woke up and found your spouse in bed with you dead. This is Kimberly Barnes. She was the editor of the local paper back in 1997. And she says that although there wasn't much solid information at first, what was eventually learned about Alvin's behavior on the day of Virginia's death didn't look good. In in the, the conversation that he had with the 911 operator, he was very, you know, flat. It was very much, my wife is dead. There was no emotion. You, you got nothing. Alvin told the authorities that Virginia had died from an epileptic seizure. But death from epilepsy is incredibly rare in this day and age. So Alvin's story just didn't ring true to either the coroner or the medical examiner. And when the coroner got to the house, he didn't want to let them in the house, which, of course, made them think, okay, what are you hiding? Well, they found family of his wife and had them come identify the body. And they told a story that Alvin Ridley had been holding their loved one against her will since approximately 1968. Virginia's family had tried multiple times over the years to see her, but Alvin had always told them that she didn't want to be bothered, even to go to her own father's funeral. They had a hard time believing that, as did everyone else now. And the story was that he kept her in a basement, only let her out when he was home, and then just decided to kill her. So if you wanted to paint a a grim picture, you got that picture, you know, very plainly. Now, they had not charged him yet, so he was walking about free. And so just a matter of days after that news came out, I started running into him and in the exact same spot every day. And the second day, I remember he just cast a look at me and nodded his head back and kept going. And I started realizing that he it was by design that he was waiting on me. And so Monday or Tuesday of the next week, just as a kind of a test, I just stopped in my tracks. And I said, uh, how are you doing, Mr. Ridley? And uh, he screwed his mouth up and looked almost like a child that was had his feelings hurt. And he started crying out. He was lashing out. Alvin started rambling about a long list of grievances, conspiracy theories, vendettas, The town, he was sure, was out to get him. It was as if the suspicions surrounding his wife's death were just the final straw. He said, oh yeah, and they're they're saying that I uh, held her for ransom, and then I killed her. Well, the first thing out of my mind was just what I had been through in my campaign, because this was a town who had completely rejected me. And I said, I know exactly how you feel. And I think it just was kind of a joke for me, but it it just kind of hit him as somebody who was connecting with him. <laughs> and so he uh, he thought he could talk to me. 
But as they kept talking, it started to become clear to McCracken that Alvin wasn't just looking for a sympathetic ear. He needed a lawyer. And where in the past I would have been very wary that uh, Alvin Ridley was guilty, how is this going to affect my politics? Suddenly, with a vengeance, I didn't care. I almost wanted to represent him to get back at the town who had rejected me. So I said, if you want me to help you, we've got to meet. When Alvin was arrested for Virginia's murder, to everyone's surprise, McCracken not only represented him at the hearing, but was able to get him out on bail. Of course, everybody's pointing and whispering and talking about him. And seeing me with him, you know, their their once state representative and failed congressional candidate started another wave of whispers. And the rumors were so prevalent that Alvin had kept his wife hostage. They weren't even saying allegedly. They were saying, you know, did he kill her after keeping her hostage for 30 years? Meanwhile, the only person who was really getting to know Alvin was McCracken. And McCracken wasn't sure what to think. He, he was 56 years old, and he looked much older. I don't think anybody would choose to have the life that he had. He always was wearing clothes that were old. He always did keep his hair combed well, and he was always shaved, which I thought was interesting since he didn't have running water in his home. So he had a bit of pride about him. But he, but he was starting to fall apart. He started wearing this neck brace. It was like one of these collars that people who fake car accidents wear. It, it, it was a pacifier in a way. It allowed him to look pitiful and feel pitiful at the same time. But this one was so old and sweaty and brown that it really just reeked. Finally, I said, Alvin, do me a favor. Before we go to court, I want you to go down to the truck stop, shower, take you some clean clothes, because it's really getting hard to sit next to you, buddy. Well, I was working at my office that night, and a skunk was in my air conditioning duct, and it sprayed up where I visibly saw spray. It settled on all of the files of the case. It got on me, and I go to court the next day, and Alvin Ridley gets to say to me, I don't know if I can sit next to you. And it was a realization that sometimes we can't help our circumstances. McCracken ended up with a lot of anecdotes about Alvin like this, ones where Alvin would somehow manage to turn the tables on him in a fun way. But Alvin never really seemed threatening to McCracken. If anything, he just seemed confused and scared, harmless. And then finally I got the state discovery packet. And this is when I first saw the autopsy. Before McCracken had represented him, Alvin had been obsessed with trying to get the state not to perform an autopsy. And now McCracken thought he could see why. It was some pretty damning stuff. The medical examiner looked at a body that was a delicate, small framed woman of about 49 years old with petechial hemorrhages around her eyes and mouth, which are indicative in cases of asphyxiation. What did that say to you about your client? Well, you know, I knew that bad things happen to good people. I didn't know if it was possible that they had had a fight. I kept, I tried to keep my mind open, but I felt like he had probably done it, that he was grie- he's grieving terribly over it. And, uh, but it was, it was uh, what I thought. Compounding that was the issue of Alvin's home, where they'd found Virginia's body. The same house with all the keep out signs and boarded up windows. And I'd been asking to get in his home for months with a camera, and he just wouldn't let me. He was acting so strange not letting me in. So here we were a couple of weeks before a potential murder trial, and I had nothing. I had nothing as a defense. Then there was the matter of jury selection. It's very hard to pick a jury in a small town 
for somebody like Alvin Ridley. Almost all of them knew him by reputation. Almost all of them had heard about the case. That was a huge thing to overcome. And I was not completely confident with the jury that we got. I, honest to goodness, never in a million years thought I would be picked on that jury. Never. I mean, it, it was a joke for me even to be there. This is Kimberly Barnes again, the journalist. She just happened to be called for jury selection that day. But of course, she had been covering Alvin's case. In most courtrooms, even having read an article about a case is enough to get you kicked out of the jury pool. And it was like, okay, yeah, I'll go down there. I'll collect my 40 bucks. And, you know, they will dismiss me and say, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Glad to see you go on home. (laughs) Yeah, that didn't go so good. Apparently that's not enough to get you off the jury. And, uh, And she got on. And I thought, now, how is this really going to work? Did you feel like, um, were you regretting taking on this case by, at this point? Oh, it was not just me. I had a judge tell me, well, everybody's saying you two deserve each other. And uh, so, it, you know, it was another, uh, another uh, potential failure in the making. Snap Judgment, the Dirty Work episode returns, the trial of Alvin Ridley. Don't miss a moment. Snap Judgment, the Dirty Work episode. Stay tuned. A young black man discovers his musical calling and sets off for Europe, trading his comfortable suburban life for sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the Tony Award-winning musical, Passing Strange. Bursting with electrifying punk, rock, blues, gospel, and jazz music, Passing Strange radiates with humor, passion, and heart. The New York Times calls it fresh and bitingly funny, and Rolling Stone says it is an experience that blows the roof off. Don't miss Passing Strange, now playing through June 18th at Signature Theater, Get tickets at sigtheater.org. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Dirty Work episode. And know this, Snap is, we're about to play the second part of a two-part story on the murder trial of Alvin Ridley. If you're just joining us on the radio, stop now. Take this opportunity to subscribe to our podcast and listen to part one and if you're listening to these words for the second time because you took my advice, you made a very good decision. Our own Joe Rosenberg takes it from here. In hindsight, it's easy to see that McCracken Poston had made a terrible mistake. One shouldn't go out of one's way to represent the scariest man in town on a murder charge. But he had, and now McCracken was beginning to suspect that one judge was right, that he and Alvin deserved each other. Just before jury selection, he had found two key pieces of exculpatory evidence. It turned out that another autopsy of someone who had died from an epileptic seizure demonstrated that such a seizure could produce the kind of particular hemorrhaging around the eyes and mouth found on Virginia. That would support Alvin's version of events. But for McCracken, it wasn't enough. It mitigated toward reasonable doubt. And that's the only way I thought about it right there. Because I still had that nagging doubt. You know, why would the woman not want to get out and see her family? Why would she not want to go to her father's funeral? You know, what is going on with this mystery woman? And here's his own lawyer begging to get in that house, and he keeps putting me off. Well, Thanksgiving came, and toward the end of Thanksgiving dinner, my parents said, we want to package up some food and we want you to take it to Mr. Ridley. Well, that's the last place I wanted to go on Thanksgiving. But without calling him or anything, I drove back to his house and I've got a couple of grocery bags and he comes to the door and opens it. And I said, Alvin, my folks wanted you to have some food for Thanksgiving. He looked at the bags, he looked at me and he said, wait just a minute. 
and he closed the door and I can hear him inside like he's talking to somebody. And then he comes and opens the door and I get to go into this very, very strange place. The first door is a closed in porch and and it was not a pleasant place to be. There was a lot of uh, vermin and a lot of uh, just odor. But when you turn to the right, you go into basically the main room of the house. I can't see anything well because the whole room is is dark and it's illuminated by like a single red large Christmas light bulb. But then a regular bulb comes on. And right there in front of me, along one whole wall and part of another wall, there's all this, this stuff And it was just about every type of paper or cardboard that you can imagine, that that anything that could bear ink. And it was attached to the wall in every way you could attach such to a wall. The cardboard, the heavier stuff was nailed, stapled. The paper was taped. And when McCracken looked closely, he could see that every item was covered from top to bottom in writing. And it was all done in this very unique hand. And I said, Alvin, what is this? And he said, well, Virginia wrote it. Virginia had something that's not uncommon in patients with epilepsy called hypergraphia. It compelled her to write down everything that she possibly could write down. She'd had the condition for decades. And from the tens of thousands of documents, I found something from just about every month of 27 years. She talked about the moon landings. There's a poem. There's a a funny reference to something going on in town. She wrote three U.S. presidents. The most interesting thing was that she had written a proposed script for the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. And I couldn't believe it. I said, Alvin, I got to have this. The problem was, Alvin said, you can't have any of this. It's all I've got left of her. And so I had to compromise with him. On the first day of the trial, when Alvin and McCracken walked into the courtroom, everyone noticed the same thing. Alvin's got these suitcases that look like they're from 1954, and we were all wondering what was in the suitcases. And at one point, the suitcase is sitting open, and you see McCracken kind of reach over with his foot and kind of start stomping, and that foot keeps stepping out further and further away from the desk, and and he's, he's stomping roaches. I had cockroaches crawling all over me. I had to be on constant watch. They were crawling on our table. They were crawling up my tie. They were, they were about to drive us crazy. And, of course, the jurors all are sitting over there just, you know, cracking up, um, you know, because we didn't know what was crawling out of those suitcases next. But when he opened them up, what they were were Virginia's testimony. And the jurors were leaning forward, spellbound, because here is the mystery woman that no one knew existed speaking out from the dead. Whether it was on the back of an envelope or a grocery receipt, the answers were there. You know, this whole thing of, you know, that, you know, he kept her locked up in a way from her family. Well, no, because she had written that her family was now Alvin. All of her writings were Alvin and Virginia, Alvin and Virginia, Alvin and Virginia. So she was choosing to be there. In her writings, Virginia explained how she never ventured outside because of her epilepsy. She had always been painfully shy, and her greatest fear was going out in public and then having an epileptic fit. And in one of the five Bibles that she filled up the margins with her own writing, On a date in 1977, she wrote, I've stopped taking my medicine today. God has told me he's going to take care of me from here on. And she lived 20 years not medicating. And that, of course, set her up for the classic sudden death and epilepsy case. 
the same kind of sudden death in epilepsy that produces the same petechial hemorrhaging around the eyes and mouth that the medical examiner had interpreted as a sign of strangulation. And, and what was happening is the, the better things happened, we started getting a little following in the courthouse. And one of my lawyer friends, he came up and said, you've got this thing won just as long as you keep Alvin Ridley off the stand. And I just said, yeah, that's the plan. There's no way I'm going to put him on the stand. And, of course, that's when I sent Alvin to lunch. And Jesus appeared to him in a vision during lunch and told him that he had to testify. Were you surprised when Alvin took the stand? <sighs> Floored. And you kind of saw McCracken when he when Alvin was going to the stand, this look on his face like, well, it's all done with now. And I was very frightened that something was going to come up that I wasn't expecting. Alvin had uh, done enough strange things. And what made it more frightening for me was that this man is innocent. I didn't know what to think. I wasn't convinced that the prosecution had made their case that, yes, you know, he had done these things that he was accused of, but, you know, we are all capable. I was I was still sitting on that fence. But when Alvin took the stand, I remember somebody asking, did you have children or why didn't you have children? And his response was very sad in, no, we were never blessed. So what you got was Virginia was his whole world. And as we were waiting for the jury, he got very quiet. And I saw the concern on his face because any sentence of just about any length with Alvin would have been like a death sentence. I, I didn't know if I had done enough. I didn't know if uh, I could do enough. And as I stood in the corner of the courtroom at the window, kind of facing out, I realized that I was not only praying with him, but that I had my arm around him tight, shoulder to shoulder. I didn't smell him. Nothing about him bothered me at that moment. We had been through a war together. And then the court clerk lets the judge know that the jury has a verdict and you just would have to hear his voice. Just this booming in the Superior Court for the County of Catoosa, State of Georgia, criminal action number 98 CR 836, the State of Georgia versus Alvin Eugene Ridley, and all this buildup and you're quaking in your seat. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant. Count one, not guilty. Count two, not guilty. Count three, not guilty. The courtroom erupted. McCracken probably about fell out of his chair, and Alvin started crying. I truly don't think he believed that it, that it was going to come back not guilty. And then we walked together out on the courthouse steps, which was a special place for me because that's where... I had accepted my first election. That's where I had conceded my last defeat in politics. And uh, being with Alvin on those steps was the best of all of those times. For Virginia's family, the courthouse steps also had a special meaning. They were the last place they or anyone else had seen Virginia in public 27 years before. Joe, I have one more thing that I've left out. Th throughout the case, I would get frustrated with him. And I would ask him, I would say, why did you stalk me? Why were you constantly making sure we were running into each other? And wh why did you pick me? And he would always say, I'll tell you one day. But that was such a classic put off from Alvin. I didn't think anything of it. And then at the very end of the trial we're in my office and i just you know i guess i just said alvin thank you you know this is a special thing for me to be a part of 
And I said, why you told me you were going to tell me one day why you picked me. And he said, I'm going to. And he has a VHS cassette and on it was my name in Virginia's handwriting. I pop it in the VCR and it is the one televised debate of my congressional race in 1996. And he said, she always liked you. Kraken Poston continues to practice law out of his offices in downtown Ringgold. Alvin Ridley's house sits just a few blocks away. Now, we reached out to Alvin for this story, but he declined an interview saying that he values his privacy and that he still loves and misses his wife. It's been 19 years since she passed away. The original score for that story was created by Renzo Gorio, and the piece was produced by Joe Rosenberg. Now, when Snap Judgment continues, we're going to get some cotton candy, some deep-fried Coca-Cola, and a big fat pickle. The Dirty Work episode returns in just a moment. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Dirty Work episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and today we're exploring those times in every life when you have to roll up your sleeves and do that which you do not wish to do. Our next story takes us back to the early 60s small town Michigan when Pete Fenton was a shy math whiz. That all changed his senior year in school. Snap Judgment. Pete was heading out of his favorite class, geometry, when the unthinkable happened. Jackie, tall, slick back hair, junior rat pack guy, pulled him aside to talk business. He hands me a $20 bill, and at the bottom was his phone number. 415. He says, that's my business card. How would you like to have more money, more broads, and more booze than you've ever had in your life? And uh, <laughs> kind of took me back because I hadn't had much of any of it. Nine, nine, eight. Listen, Pete, I want you, and you only, to help me start a Las Vegas-style casino in my basement. Are you with me? After a pause where a lot of stuff was going through my head, I said, yes. You see, Pete idolized Jackie. He may not have completely trusted him, but he had a girlfriend, drove a Thunderbird, and now maybe he could taste some of that too. Then the meeting ends. He says, wait a minute. I'm low on business cards. Could you give me that one back and I'll return it to you later? Of course, being the $20 bill that he gave me. I gave it to him, never got it back. After school in Jackie's basement, Jackie would train Pete in the art of the con. Jackie's parents ran a traveling carnival and Jackie ran the games. So he showed Pete his marked blackjack cards, loaded dice, a modified craps table, and Pete soaked it up. Opening night, they start trickling in early on. By midnight, it was just packed. Everybody was there, the football players, all the cool kids who wouldn't have anything to do with me before, and we're supplying them with free drinks. I was on the other side of the table. They maybe never gambled before in their lives. That was just, wow, all I've got to do is stand there and take in the money. Like the jocks, oh boy, I loved taking their money. But other people that I've been friendly with I felt guilty about taking the money from them. But a business is a business, right? And they were pulling in hundreds of dollars a night. Also for Pete, the best part of the casino came after the casino, when they would just be normal guys and hang out. We'd watch monster movies, we'd joke about them, which of course we thought the jokes we were making were the best ever. Jackie had a a couple of pinball machines. One of them didn't work. He opened it up and it was filled with girly magazines. So we'd browse through those. 
what brought us really together is we both had a wound. Jackie, his mother, would yell at him from the moment he walked in to the moment he left. His father never said a word to Jackie or anyone else or his wife. On the other hand, my father was an alcoholic, my mother was for many years, and we bounded over that even though we never spoke of it. The relationship I had with Jackie was we were best friends, and it seemed like he considered it the same way. Then one day, a week before graduation, Jackie came to me and said, The casino, it's over. We're done. I said, Why? We're doing really well. I said, You know what? This is good, but I got something better. You know that I work on the carnival. I want you to come along with me. Would you be willing to do it? This time, I didn't have any kind of qualms about it whatsoever. Yes. So after graduation, the boys hit the road with the carnival. And to Pete, it felt like freedom. What I enjoyed most about being a carny was the atmosphere. All the colored lights at night, smells of the cotton candy, shrieking rides, each of which had its own music system, and it all kind of melded together in just some sort of sensory overload. So I had that adrenaline rush every day. As hard as it is to believe, I was like a visiting rock star. Girls would come up to you just because you were a carny. They were enthralled by you. You know, it was exciting that a celebrity actually wanted to go out on a date with them. Plus, I was being paid $25 a day. Very, very respectable for the time. Jackie also showed Pete how to run the games, like the duck pond and the cat rack, and every booth Pete manned was rigged. Like in the cat rack, the game where you knock down the cats with the ball, well, Pete controlled the cats with a secret lever by his foot. They're so excited by the fact that they're almost winning this big prize, they don't pay attention to anything. Nobody in the whole history of the time I was doing this ever figured it out. Oh, man! At first, I had a few qualms about it, but then I would be able to impress the person who was important to me. And so, to be honest, uh, it didn't bother me. After each day of ripping off customers, the boys would hang out in Jackie's Airstream trailer and count their dough. Then Jackie would take Pete to the local town and introduce him to the world of the senses. I had my first sip of alcohol with him. I started smoking cigarettes, put them in my mouth and pretended to smoke. Good music, all of the Motown artists. I uh, had my first sexual uh, involvement with a, uh, with a lady of the night. So it wasn't romantic, but at least I got that out of the way. Everything was going fine until one of the veteran carnies talked to me and he asked me to go down and buy a couple of six-packs and he'd pay me back. And I said, I don't have the money to buy the six-packs. He says, you got to be kidding me. The game you're working on, you should be rolling in the money. And I said, no, I'm only making $25 a day on this. And he said, no, you're supposed to be getting 10% of the total take every day. 10%? That would be like hundreds of dollars. Wait, are you kidding me? I'm Jackie's buddy. Of course he's giving me the right thing. He said, no. The guy said, the veteran carnies deal with that as we age. Oh, you hold out the amount of money that's warranted from working that game. It was an eye-opener. I was still buddies with Jackie. We were still getting along great. But I started HOing no more and no less than 10% of the money. At first, I felt guilty about HOing, which was weird because here I am, essentially stealing money from the people who walk down the midway. But I felt guilty about doing it with a friend of mine. Eventually, I just couldn't H.O. anymore. So I went up to Jackie and told him I knew what was going on. And he said, Pete, I got a business here. I really can't afford to pay you the full amount right now. For one thing, because I don't have the cash flow. And secondly, you're a new guy. I'm giving you the opportunity to do this. So how about this as an alternative? I'll pay you the correct percentage, but I will give you the fair percentage when the season is done. It's going to be like a year-end bonus. So, you know, he's been my buddy, and I so okay, fine, year-end bonus, that's good. Over the summer, Pete became the top dog Carney, Jackie's right and left-hand man. But there was still a fly in the ointment, and that was that Jackie had promised that he was going to give me this bonus at the end of the summer. 
So on the second to last day of summer, Pete hosted a kickback at his motel room with Jackie and some guys, including a carny who went by fireman. There, he finally asked Jackie, What about my bonus? The fireman speaks first and he says, Bonus? Nobody ever gives somebody a bonus at the end of the year. That's a bunch of baloney. And I said, come on, Jackie, you know, we talked about it, you know this. And Jackie said, you know, he just won't respond. Here we go, I realize, okay, there isn't going to be any bonus at the end of the year. This has been all a bunch of crap. Finally, after a long back and forth, we settled on something that I had never heard of before, the Indiana bust-out. The Indiana bust-out is an ancient carny tradition. Over the course of one day, the boys would go head-to-head in every booth, using every carny trick up their sleeve to pull in customers and get that money. The bet was double or nothing. The fireman would total up their earnings at the end, and if Jackie won, Pete got nothing. But if Pete won, Pete would get the bonus, doubled. It was hard to sleep that night, and I woke up that following morning, took a shower, put on my coolest suit. Jackie and Pete lined up at the first booth to begin the bust out, while the other carnies took bets. And with the ring of the cowbell, the Indiana bust out was on. Hey, hey guys, guys, yeah, you three guys over there, come here. All the winning duck is in there. These things just don't fly away. They're made out of plastic. Uh, So right over here. The winning duck is right over here. Oh, man, that was so close. I can't believe it. No, I'm sorry. On the corner, yeah. Five for three, the fourth one's free. It's a little too soft. You gotta earn it. Oh! Right, sir, how we doing today? Lob it up there. Right, ready? Oh, Go ahead. Forget about Pete. I'll cut you a better deal. I'm sweating at the corner of the eye. It seems like he's doing better than me. There were some of the games that I had never worked before. And when I'm doing this, I'm kind of reviewing the arc of the relationship from the first time that we met to the casino to him helping me out and then me learning that he was screwing me. I wondered, had we ever really been friends? Or was I simply a really good employee? Usually I don't I'm trying do. to give away every prize before I quit. You just came by at the right time. <laughs> boss would oh, yeah, if you go play the game. But give me a dollar. I'll ah. give you two out of three in a few weeks. So that's it. We're done. We walk over to Jackie's trailer. We break out some drinks. It took a long while to count the money. Then finally, the fireman says, okay, here you go. Jackie, you brought in 2,183 bucks. Wow. I said, dude, that's a lot. The fireman turns to me and says, okay, Pete, I hate to tell you this, but you won 2,586. You win. What? Because he started out with, I hate to tell you this, I didn't grasp that I had won. Jackie was ticked off. He took off. It was quite a moment because I had just beaten him, but but, but I have a little bit of secret. I had paid the fireman ahead of time to miscount me into winning more money than Jackie. Then the fireman said, listen, Jackie won playing this thing fair and square, but that doesn't matter. You won playing it the 100% carny way. Jackie never thought of that, so you are the true carny. You won. For the first time that summer, Jackie and I didn't get together in his Airstream, and this was the last day. So Pete packed up his stuff and rolled out. He rode his motorcycle to the nearest bar to grab a drink. And that's when he saw... Jackie, I couldn't believe it. I don't know what's going to happen when I go over to him, but I decide that I've got to do it. He looks at me and he says, Man, you did well. I thought it wouldn't be close. I had kind of a winner's remorse that I'd beaten the only guy that I looked up to. Jackie says, I have to be honest with you. You know, we never talk much about our feelings, but I've had it with this carnival business. I was raised in a ticket booth. My mom tried to make me a profit center from practically the day that I came out of her womb for which she never stopped blaming me. I grew up not trusting anyone. Everybody I knew was a puke who was out to take you for anything they could. This is the kind of environment I grew up in, and I don't want to be in that. I want normal. I'm going to business school and leave this all behind. 
that was kind of stunning. You know, he'd never really been open with me in that way before. Then he says to me, you know what? I always knew that you were stealing money from me. Don't worry about it. Wait a minute, why, if you knew, why didn't you fire me? He says, you know, all of the guys, every car he holds out, but I figured that because you were my friend, you would steal less than the other people because you would feel guilt. And I was right. You were relatively honest. You stole less from me than the other guys, so it kind of evened out. I had mixed feelings about it. On one hand, he was acknowledging that I was a relatively honest person, but then on the other hand, there was kind of a rupture there. I had learned everything I could from Jackie, and he had gotten what he needed out of me, which may be a friend or quasi-friend. So we said our goodbyes at that point. I rode my motorcycle off, and it was like I was walking off into the... I didn't know whether it was a sunset or a sunrise. Thank you, Pete Fenton, for sharing that story with Snap. Now, after that summer, Jackie quit his family's traveling carnival and went on to business school. To learn more about being a first-class huckster, check out Pete's book, Eyeing the Flash, The Making of a Carnival Con Artist. We'll have a link on our website, snapjudgment.org. Original sound design for that story was by Leon Morimoto and Davey Kim. It was produced by Davey Triple Threat Kim. It's about that time. You made it out. Get the amazing storytelling podcast delivered to your phone each and every week. Subscribe right now. Right now, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever service you use, it's there. Snapjudgment.org. The Snap was produced by the crew that always gets their hands dirty. Make some noise, please, for the Uber producer, Mark Ristich. Pat Masidi Miller drives shotgun. And a suspect is the lookout. The Heavy, Julia DeWitt, Joe Brass Knuckles Rosenberg, Nancy Lopez, The Collector, Davey, The Snub Nose Kim, Work in the Back Room, Got Eliza Smith, Anna Adlerstein, Leon Morimoto, and Matt Ducat. Jasmine Aguilera isn't trying to hear it. And this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could run away, join the circus as a magician, get dunked underwater, wrapped in chains for the amazing escape finale, only to realize you left the secret key on your dresser. And you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PRX. A young black man discovers his musical calling, and sets off for Europe, trading his comfortable suburban life for sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the Tony Award-winning musical Passing Strange. Bursting with electrifying punk, rock, blues, gospel, and jazz music, Passing Strange radiates with humor, passion, and heart. The New York Times calls it fresh and bitingly funny, and Rolling Stone says it is an experience that blows the roof off. Don't miss Passing Strange, now playing through June 18th at Signature Theater. Get tickets at sigtheater.org.